Hello, I'm Darren again. Today's question asks if I would discuss narcissistic personality disorder. Now, if you like this video, if you find it helpful, please click like and please consider subscribing to my channel for future updates on mental health related topics. But just as a reminder, this video is not a substitute for support from a mental health professional, nor is it a tool to be used to diagnose someone. Now, when we're talking about narcissism, it's something we often associate with someone who is toxic, someone who is selfish, someone who can be abusive. And yes, there may well be very strong traits of narcissism there, but not necessarily a personality disorder. With a personality disorder, this is an extreme form of narcissism. It's constantly present, it's long-term, it's pervasive, and it's chronic. And I often describe a disorder as looking at the impact it has on a person's day-to-day -day functioning, the impact it has on the relationship they have with themselves and with other people around them. The disorder itself can also be comorbid, meaning it's present alongside another personality disorder, such as antisocial personality disorder. But for today, I'm just going to be looking at narcissistic personality disorder as set out in DSM-5. So it's part of the cluster B group of personalities. Now, these personality types are considered to have erratic behavior and a difficulty in regulating emotions. And like all personality disorders, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of diagnosis. There is what I often think of as a spectrum, meaning there are many different colours and many different shades. And with narcissism, we see the same thing. The two most common types would be the grandiose narcissist, sometimes referred to as the overt narcissist. This is the in-your-face, there's no one like me kind of narcissist. You're privileged to have you know, have me in your life. Um, very resistant to criticism. The other being the covert or the vulnerable narcissist. Now, this is the one who's very sensitive to criticism and will often play the victim, the helpless or the innocent victim. And according to DSM-5, there are nine criteria that go into making a diagnosis, five of which must be met consistently to be able to diagnose. So let's have a closer look at them. Criteria number one, has a grandiose sense of self-importance. Now, this can involve exaggerating pretty much everything. Uh, their achievements, their affluence, exaggerating how important their input into something has been. And regardless of anyone else's skill sets, accomplishments, beliefs, they will claim they know more about it. They will know more about plumbing than the plumber. They will know more about brain surgery than the brain surgeon. Criteria number two is preoccupied with fantasies of success, power, brilliance, beauty, and perfect love. This meaning they believe themselves to be perfect, flawless, highly accomplished at pretty much everything. Regardless of their position, say in the workplace in an organization, they believe that they are running it. The place would close down tomorrow if they were to leave. There can be little to no regard or respect for other people's boundaries, for their self-will, for their autonomy. They tend to give other people choices, choices that they decide would be in their best interest. Criteria number three. They believe that they are special and can only be understood or should associate with other people or organisations that are special. Now, again, in a work setting, this could look like they only ever really associate with people at a higher level than they are. People at the same level, they tend to either ignore or just at best tolerate. Anyone at a junior level um, is either going to be ignored, is going to be bullied, is going to be ordered around. The belief being, I suppose, that this is their world and others are privileged to be allowed to be a part in it. Anyone that they see as beneath them, they generally aren't going to waste their time with them. Number four, requires excessive admiration. Now, with narcissistic personality disorder, there is a need to be worshipped. No good deed goes unpraised. Uh, charity begins with an audience. I've made a video recently on the altruistic narcissist, if you want to have a look at that, just to see what I mean. Now, I think that this is due to a lack of emotional depth and a, a lack of insight and a lack of the ability to self-validate. The constant need for external validation and praise feeds their ego. They are drop-dead gorgeous. They are the funniest, most intelligent person you will ever meet. And some may confuse this with, a, with high self-esteem, when actually the opposite is true. This is extremely low self-esteem. When they aren't praised, when they don't get the recognition they feel they deserve, 
this can be extremely crushing and it can bring about either uh, a rage, a, a manic episode, or it can bring about extreme depression. An example that comes to mind would be someone who made me tea once. They just offered me a cup of tea. I, yeah, thank you very much. But they put sugar in it. Now, I don't take sugar. And all I did was point out that I don't take sugar. She spent the rest of the day with her knuckles trailing on the floor, weeping, just wanting the world to end, but shouting at the junior people around her. Criteria number five has a sense of entitlement such as unreasonable expectations for favourable treatment or compliance with their expectations. Now, as the criteria suggests, people with narcissistic personality disorder believe that they are entitled. They deserve the top position, even if they've no experience or aptitude. They deserve the credit and praise for whatever it is, even if they played little to no part in it and they demand that others meet their sometimes unreasonable or unrealistic expectations. When they don't meet their own expectations, they will often blame or lash out at others. When others don't meet their expectations, sometimes they're constantly shifting expectations. Again, this can bring about an episode of outrage or low mood and depression. Criteria number six is exploitative and takes advantage of others to achieve their own ends. Now, depending on the nature, the severity of the disorder, even the situation, this, this exploitation, yes, it can be deliberate, but it's not necessarily a conscious decision. It's, uh, they just exploit others because it's all they know how to do. They don't necessarily know how to debate or negotiate in order to get what they want. And that could look like maybe, maybe them asking someone to help them out with a task or a project or something but pretty much not asking them to help, just getting them to do all the work. However, when the work is completed, they tend to take the credit for themselves. Other times they may set a task to set someone up to fail. They get to feel good by devaluing that person whenever they fail. Number seven, lacks empathy and is unwilling to identify with the needs of others. Now the key term being unwilling, not unable. When we think of a lack of empathy, now that does not mean no empathy. It's an empathy deficit. Now, sometimes when sometimes it might mean the narcissist is maybe unable to recognize the impact of their behaviors on others. Remember, they struggle to regulate their own feelings. Other times, when a narcissist is being malignant, it's because there is a level of empathy. There is enough empathy there, and it's, sometimes it's referred to as a cognitive empathy or a dark empathy. And again, I've made a video on dark empathy, the dark empath, if you want to check that out. But with dark or cognitive empathy, they can generally understand what it is they're doing. They understand the impact it's having on others, the fact that maybe they're hurting them or putting them under a strain or whatever. The thing is, when being malignant, they enjoy it. They get a kick out of it. Number eight is envious of others and believes that others are envious of them. Now again, it is what it says, and that envy can manifest itself in many different ways. They, they may be overly controlling in their relationships, not wanting the partner to have any other friends or contact with anyone else, constantly accusing them of cheating, being up to no good. And it could be, uh, it could be not just the controlling, not just because they're selfish. It could be at times because they envy the partner's ability to connect with others on more than just the surface level. Other times it may be a fear of others pointing out how badly that person's being treated. That person might leave. Then there is the wanting to be envied. Now, an example of this would be a guy I used to know who, who would either lift his phone or his car keys out of his pocket. And when he was doing that, he would be scanning the room to see if people can see his brand new phone or the type of car that he's driving. Now, if no one noticed, he would be making exaggerated gestures to try and get people to notice. And if that didn't work, then he would just start openly talking about his brand new whatever it is and how amazing it is. But one way or another, constantly wanting others to notice what he has or what he could do or what he had done, wanting them to envy him. Lastly, criteria number nine shows arrogant, haughty behaviours and attitudes. Now, again, I think this is more an indication of low self-esteem. You know, people with a healthy level of self-esteem don't necessarily need to make other people feel bad just to feel good about themselves. People with a healthy level of self-esteem can bring out the best in others and not feel threatened. Now, this behavior can look like being condescending to others, playing down, ridiculing, scorning other people's achievements, efforts, whatever. 
And because they are very resistant or sensitive to any kind of criticism, even a disagreement, that can be humiliating to them. So what we often see is this behaviour crank up a gear or two. Now, the guy I was telling you about earlier with the keys and the phone and so on, again, he would lift it out for people to see. He would try and wave it about to try and get their attention. He would he would be openly talking about how amazing this whatever it is is. And when he still wasn't getting the praise, he would uh, what he would do is he would tend to get somebody on their own and actually openly tell them to their face how envious and jealous they are. Then they would go into either a rage or a sulk when that person challenged them and even told other people about their bad behaviour. So what we see, when we see a combination of these criteria, when these are combined, we see someone who is intensely disagreeable. We see someone who will reject anything outside of their own frame of reference. They have a strong belief that others must believe and comply with them. We see controlling behaviour either through domination, through intimidation, through sarcasm, or we see guilt tripping and shaming. There is an inability to accept any responsibility for themselves. And because of that lack of responsibility, they never really seem to grow. So where does it come from? Well, I think that's a video for itself another time. We could be here all day discussing that, but there are strong indications of both biological and environmental factors at play. Can someone with narcissistic personality disorder be helped? Well, I think they can, but I think they can in the sense it involves them recognizing something has to change. They would need to recognize the impact their behavior has on themselves and on others. They would have to want to do the work in order to change. However, I think the difficulty is the belief that they are already perfect. Any, any faults lie outside of themselves. That belief is so strong. So if they believe the fault lies outside of themselves, they often believe the solution lies outside of themselves. Other people have to change in order to make the world better. Anyway, that's a brief outline of narcissistic personality disorder. Now, if you have any comments, experiences, things you'd like to share, please use the comment box below. I am interested in some of the interesting discussions that are starting around these videos. If you like this video, if you found it helpful, please consider subscribing to my channel for future updates on mental health related topics. And until next time, thanks for watching.